Hello everyone. Today I'll be discussing antihypertensive medications. The learning objectives are first, to list the major classes of antihypertensives and describe their mechanisms of action, and second, to choose an initial antihypertensive regimen based upon a patient's demographics and medical comorbidities. To introduce the classes of antihypertensives, I'm going to bring back some diagrams from the introductory video on hypertension. In that video, I discussed that the two major physiologic systems, which were indisputably involved in the development of hypertension, were the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system and the sympathetic nervous system. So here is a diagram of the first of those two. This displays how a series of prohormones are converted through a series of steps catalyzed by the enzymes renin and angiotensin converting enzyme, the net consequence of which is the production of the active hormones angiotensin II and aldosterone, which collectively work to cause systemic vasoconstriction and increased reabsorption of sodium in the renal tubules. There are five distinct classes of antihypertensive medications which interfere with one of the steps shown here. Starting with the two most important, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, commonly called ACE inhibitors, block the conversion of the inactive angiotensin 1 to the active angiotensin 2. Diuretic medications, which are a particularly diverse class, including thiazide, loop, and so-called potassium sparing diuretics, directly interfere with renal sodium reabsorption in the kidneys. There are also angiotensin II receptor blockers, also called ARBs or ARBs, which block the action of angiotensin II and are clinically almost identical to ACE inhibitors. Likewise, there are also aldosterone antagonists. Finally, the newest class of medications which interfere with this system are called direct renin inhibitors. Then there are drugs that inhibit the sympathetic nervous system. Coincidentally, there are also five general categories here. These include beta blockers, which inhibit epinephrine and norepinephrine's activities at beta adrenergic receptors, which are normally responsible for increasing the heart rate and myocardial contractility. And there are alpha blockers, which inhibit those hormones activity on alpha adrenergic receptors, which are normally responsible for inducing systemic vasoconstriction. There are two different subtypes of calcium channel blockers. They include dihydropyridines, which act to block systemic vasoconstriction. And there are non-dihydropyridines, which primarily act to reduce heart rate and contractility. Although clinically it isn't typically grouped with the dihydropyridines, I think on purely physiologic grounds, the medication hydralazine belongs here as it is a pure arterial vasodilator with similar effect. Finally, the last category here are the centrally active alpha-2 agonists, clonidine and methyldopa, which inhibit the sympathetic nervous system within the brainstem. Although it would seem that these two drugs would be the best as they act very proximally and can thus inhibit both the cardiac and vascular end effects of sympathetic stimulation, unfortunately they have not been nearly as helpful as the other classes of drugs. Methyl dopa is used almost solely in pregnancy when many other drugs are held due to concern for risk to the fetus, and clonidine is reserved for a third or even fourth line medication pretty much to be used only when all else fails. There is one final class of medications which does not clearly map to one of these two diagrams. That class is nitrates. For example, isosorbide mononitrate and isosorbide dinitrate. These two drugs work primarily by inducing venodilation. Venodilation reduces blood return to the heart, which in patients with normal or near normal intracardiac blood volume results in a reduction in cardiac output. Nitrates also lead to arterial and arteriolar dilation, though this effect is usually less pronounced. If you count the three subclasses of diuretics separately, that gives us 13 different classes of medications to remember, 
which can be difficult when first starting out in medicine. Luckily, there are some naming conventions that can help identifying drug class. ACE inhibitors always end in PRIL or PRIL. Common examples include lisinopril, benazapril, focinopril, and enalapril. Important side effects of the ACE inhibitors is a dry cough and renal dysfunction. Thiazide diuretics have no common suffix, but there are only a couple to remember, all with similar sounding names. Hydrochlorothiazide, chlorothiazide, and chlorothalidone. Side effects include hypokalemia, hyponatremia, renal dysfunction, and a modest increase in insulin resistance. That means it can make type 2 diabetes just a little bit worse. Loop diuretics have no common suffix, but there are also very few in number. In the US, they are essentially just furosemide, bumetanide, and torsemide. Side effects are similar to the thiazides, except for the insulin resistance, which is not present from the loop diuretics. Dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers all end in dipene, such as amlodipine, philodipine, nicardipine, and nifedipine. Common side effects are constipation and lower extremity edema. The non-dihydropyridines have no common suffix and essentially just include diltiazem and verapamil. As you might expect, they can lead to low cardiac output and bradycardia. The ARBs end in sartin, such as losartin, valsartin, and irbosartin. They can cause renal dysfunction. Beta blockers end in allol, such as metoprolol, carvedilol, labetalol, propranolol, and esmolol. In an acute time frame, they can lower myocardial contractility, even if they can improve it in the long term. Other side effects include bradycardia, fatigue, sexual dysfunction, and depression. My personal experience is that beta blockers are the antihypertensive drug class that when used in uh, relatively healthy people for the treatment of hypertension have the greatest risk of some side effect developing. Finally, alpha blockers end in OSIN, terazosin, prazosin, and doxazosin. The major side effect of alpha blockers is orthostatic hypotension. With so many choices, once the decision has been made to start an antihypertensive, how does one choose one? The first general principle of drug selection is that the primary benefit from antihypertensive therapy is more associated with a degree of improvement in the blood pressure and not associated with the use of any one specific drug. Therefore, selection of initial monotherapy is largely driven by side effect profile and patient preference. If the systolic blood pressure is more than 20 points above target, or diastolic blood pressure is more than 10 points above target, one should consider that monotherapy will not be sufficient and that dual therapy might be best even to start off with at the beginning. So what are my specific recommendations for initial monotherapy? Assuming there are no compelling secondary indications or specific contraindications, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, for non-elderly, non-black patients, I recommend starting either an ACE inhibitor, I personally prefer twice daily lisinopril, or a thiazide diuretic, in which case chlorothalidone might be preferred over the much more common hydrochlorothiazide. For non-elderly black patients, I recommend either chlorothalidone or a dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker, such as amlodipine. The difference in recommendations for black and non-black patients stem from data suggesting that black patients tend to be less responsive to inhibition of the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. In elderly patients, because of increased risk of side effects and increased risk from side effects, I recommend avoiding meds that could be leading to renal dysfunction or electrolyte abnormalities. Thus, the hydropyridine calcium channel blockers are the best option. So why do I focus on these three medication classes instead of the other 10? It's a combination of best general side effect profiles, most frequently studied medications, most recommended meds by professional guidelines, and personal experience. With choosing antihypertensives, there are sometimes compelling secondary indications 
for one or another drug which might overrule the typical recommendations here. Let me run through them. Diuretics, particularly loop diuretics, are also helpful in heart failure. ACE inhibitors and ARBs are helpful in patients post-MI, those with heart failure, those with chronic kidney disease, and those with diabetes. The non-dihydropyridines can help rate control patients with atrial fibrillation. Beta blockers are also indicated in stable angina, post-MI, heart failure, and can control AFib. Nitrates are indicated in angina and heart failure. Both hydralazine and aldosterone antagonists are frequently used in heart failure. And finally, the primary indication for alpha blockers is actually not hypertension, but rather treatment of urinary difficulties associated with benign prostatic hypertrophy. The blood pressure lowering effect is oftentimes just a secondary benefit. In addition to compelling secondary indications, there are also compelling contraindications to specific antihypertensive classes. For example, thiazide diuretics are relatively contraindicated in diabetes since they can contribute to insulin resistance, an effect which is probably quite small. The non-dihydropyridines are contraindicated in heart failure as they have negative inotropic properties. Some beta blockers are believed to worsen insulin resistance, though it's not clear how significant this effect is, and it's not believed to be an effect seen with carvedilol. Beta blockers are also relatively contraindicated in COPD. Hydralazine is associated, or is at least rumored to be associated, with a reflex tachycardia, and thus is generally considered contraindicated in patients with angina. Aldosterone antagonists can lead to hyperkalemia, and are thus to be avoided in chronic kidney disease. And the last, some studies show worse outcomes when alpha blockers are used in patients with heart failure. Inevitably, all clinicians will be faced with the question of what to do if initial therapy is insufficient. In general, either switching to a different monotherapy or adding a second drug is more effective in controlling hypertension than escalating doses of the first drug. The risk of side effects may be increased by either adding a second drug or by escalating doses of the first, depending upon the patient and specific situation. And of course, adding a second drug may result in decreased compliance unless a combination pill is used. So the bottom line is, it's not really clear what the best strategy is if the initial dose of the initial drug is insufficient. If the decision is made to start combination therapy, the first-line combination therapy is generally considered by experts to be either an ACE inhibitor or ARB plus a dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker, for example, the combination of benazepril and amlodipine. Why is this combination thought to be the best? It's largely based on a study published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2008 called the ACCOMPLISH trial in which 11,000 patients with hypertension and other cardiovascular risk factors were randomized to receive either a combination of benazepril and amlodipine or benazepril and hydrochlorothiazide. The trial was terminated after three years once it became clear that the benazepril plus amlodipine group were having fewer heart attacks, fewer strokes, and less hospitalizations. Unfortunately, the accomplished trial was not perfect. For example, some clinicians believe that chlorothalidone may be a superior thiazide diuretic to hydrochlorothiazide and would therefore have been a better drug to have included in the study. The trial also had no calcium channel blocker plus thiazide arm. And finally, the patients enrolled in the trial were all at high risk of cardiovascular events. So it's not clear how generalizable the results are to lower risk populations. Nonetheless, this remains the generally recommended combination therapy. I'll end with a few final pearls about antihypertensive medications. ARBs have virtually identical indications and contraindications to ACE inhibitors, but due to increased cost, should generally be reserved for patients intolerant to ACE inhibitors due to the side effect of cough. Remember to monitor electrolytes and renal function after initiation and any dose increase of an ACE, ARB, or diuretic. 
When using combination therapy, if poor compliance is not a concern, it is preferable to give at least one medication at bedtime. Twice daily dosing of lisinopril may be more effective than once daily. There is both theoretical and empirical evidence to favor using chlorthalidone over hydrochlorothiazide, even though the latter is heavily favored in the U.S. Admittedly, the clinical difference between the two thiazides is probably very small. And finally, atenolol should never be used for hypertension, ever. There is a large amount of evidence that atenolol is no better than placebo at preventing a number of important adverse cardiovascular events, and all it does is expose your patient to side effects and unnecessary cost. That concludes this video on antihypertensive medications. I hope you found it interesting and useful. If you have not already done so, please consider subscribing for many more medical videos.